Um, and so the title of our presentation today is Why is Untreated ADHD Contributing to the Increasing Suicide Rate Among Black Folks? So today, to just kind of review our goals, um, we are going to, to be talking about suicide and the, and the rising rate in Black children. Um, and we're going to discuss key factors that affect um, Black children when it comes to suicide, as well as other considerations um, that impact overall mental health in children. Um, and also talk about strategies, um, right, to be problem um, solving um, and sort of solution focused, uh, discuss ways to uh, decrease the risk of suicide. So as an adult psychiatrist, you know, the way that I think about ADHD is that it is one of the neurodevelopmental disorders. So one of those disorders um, that uh, refers to how the brain develops um, to affect uh, function and performance, um, right? Um, and that really focuses on brain development. And there could be these ideas of sort of nature versus nurture, so genetics versus environment. And it doesn't have to be either or. Most times it's both end. Um, and so when we think about ADHD, those of us who are here know much about it probably, but we think about problems with uh, attention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and also this component of affective liability, I think, from my understanding, is becoming more of a focus in ADHD as well. Um, but one of the areas we're going to be focusing on is really how the environment impacts brain development and impacts children. Um, so, again, I'm not a child psychiatrist, but, you know, of course, things that we look at are the effects of nutrition, poverty. We know that, um, you know, poverty is a risk factor for many mental health conditions, um, but can affect nutrition if there's low, <coughs> excuse me, food insecurity and other factors that come with poverty. Um, but also substance use is another area. Um, whether that's substance use in, in parents or, or mothers when they're pregnant, but also parents of children, um, you know, also have uh, this sort of genetic risk for, for mental health problems themselves. Um, so again, it sort of becomes this uh, nature and nurture, genetics and environment. And that's how we'll sort of be talking about things today to just kind of put it into a context. Definitely so. And you think about, I'll say that, you know, so often you see families who are struggling who, who don't have actual good food security. So, you know, pop tart for breakfast, you know, bag of Cheetos for lunch and a, a bag of flaming hot Cheetos for dinner, you know, or two bags with Kool-Aid. And if a child's brain is being brought into fruition that way, there's going to be some deficits made when you don't have proper nutrition or especially when you can't afford it or don't know. Right. That fuel for the brain, right. fuel for the body. Um, it's very, you know, key to development. So another area that um, should be talked about is often talked about with ADHD are comorbid learning disorders. So again, as an adult psychiatrist, the way I think about these are sort of the development of learning and, you know, problems in that. Um, and you can see them um, coexisting. Um, it could, again, be either or both and. Um, and the examples I tend to think about, you know, again, I have a, a school age child, but if you see you know, uh, first or second grader going to third grade that's having problems reading. Um, you know, one of the questions is, is one, do they have something like a reading disorder um, where they're not meeting their milestones or their academic goals? Um, or there, is there something like ADHD where during those times of learning how to read, um, you know, K through three, were they just not able to sit and really hear the lessons? Did they miss phonics um, because of ADHD, um, or is it both? Um, and certainly during the pandemic, um, it's hard to really tease these out since a lot of schooling um, was virtual. Um, but the important part is to try to identify, um, you know, if there are comorbid learning disorders, because they can certainly um, contribute to impairment. Um, and in doing so, you, of course, want to be able to treat both. And that's where the idea of special services come in, you know, special education services, um, because you want to be targeting the correct symptoms. Right. And and um, that may require different types of intervention um, for either ADHD or learning disorders and or learning disorders. 
So again, ADHD in the classroom, you know, it's most often recognized in school age children who are not meeting their milestones or academic goals. Um, and teachers are often the ones who help identify. And when we went from in-person learning um, straight to virtual learning, a lot of that screening was lost. It is much harder to identify any problem in general um, through a screen than it would be in person. Um, but in particular with school-age children, some of which, again, in those early years, didn't even know how to use a computer, didn't know how to use a mouse. Um, you know, teachers just really weren't able to interact in the same way. You know, cameras might not have even been on um, in that sense. Um, and as children got older, again, there's still other challenges that come into play when it comes to virtual learning. You know, does a family have proper internet access? Are parents available to help? if there are problems. Um, I mean, we could go on and on about how the, the pandemic affects screening um, when it comes to ADHD in children. Um, but essentially by identifying the problems, then we could maybe identify solutions or accommodations. Um, and that is also, was also really challenging when the pandemic um, started. Those accommodations that were in place for in-person learning weren't necessarily translatable to virtual learning or if ADHD and or learning disorders was identified, what sort of accommodations do you give in a virtual format? And so all of that is being developed, you know, building the plane as we're, we're flying it um, and can involve teachers, but also other school services, you know, guidance counselors, principals, uh, learning specialists. Um, and all of that's impacted by the available funding, right? Which varies, you know, school to school, state to state, county to county, private versus public. Um, of course, having more resources um, is, is the goal and is more beneficial to be able to implement those classroom strategies and school interventions. They're really the key to success. Um, and so if you do see disparities or inequalities in funding, which often is the case for many um, children of color, but in particular black children, you're not going to have those keys. You're not going to have those tools in the same sort of way. And again, everything with the pandemic, everything is exacerbated. Everything is right there on the surface. So another area to really consider is that unfortunately in mental health, um, I see this with adults, um, that if there is a mental health problem, unfortunately people are shuttled into the justice system rather than the mental health system. And that's for a variety of reasons. And you see that more in black populations. Um, and so it can become a question of, you know, is ADHD really an illness? Many times people ask that because um, you know, there may be problems with behavior that list, lead, list, lead to discipline problems um, where the kid is just labeled as bad or they have bad behavior. And really, you know, is ADHD an excuse? These are some of the, the beliefs that are out there um, and that that's what we're combating a lot of times. Um, and then when we think about treatment, um, particularly when you think about the justice system, um, a lot of these systems systems have not been trustworthy. So we talk a lot about cultural mistrust um, due to past um, atrocities. We talk about, you know, the U.S. Public Health Service at Tuskegee, um, where treatment was withheld um, from Black men and all the way to modern day examples. But the way I also like to think about it is, you know, are schools trustworthy? Are, is the justice system trustworthy? Or are they really trying to control you know, children, these are some of the fears that are there along with that labeling. Um, and, um, you know, of course, access to care is um, can be compromised when we think about the justice system. And quite commonly, ADHD is misdiagnosed as uh, oppositional defiant disorder, or conduct disorder, um, without really looking at associated behavior. So you may have a child who's not able to sit down or getting out of the chair, you know, doing sort of everything but their schoolwork, which could be due to inattention or hyperactivity, but somebody may label that as defiance or breaking the rules. Um, again, with this idea of, of, of a bad child or bad behavior, rather than really examining, do they have those other features like lying or stealing um, and really um, looking deeper into that. And that will carry, you know, into adulthood. So it's, it's, fairly common for me to see those who as adults were, were likely misdiagnosed. Um, and so we're trying to address that in adulthood. 
So getting more directly to suicide. Um, suicide is one of the top causes of death among all age groups. Um, and it can re result, of course, in loss of lives, but in loss of pre productivity, you know. Um, so as a leading cause of death, you do not have those individuals who are able to function in society, be parts of families. Um, historically, suicide rates have been higher among white populations than black populations among all groups. Um, and suicide rates are growing among most groups. Um, firearms contribute to uh, half of all completed suicides by working in uh, the VA. It's a focus of our trainings for suicide prevention and specifically firearms and reducing access to lethal means um, because we're having 123 suicides per day. So how can we help to try to prevent these? And when we think about children in particular, it's the second leading cause of death in children 10 to 24 years old, with the first, is I, I believe, is still accidents among children. And the rates are rising among younger children, ages 5 to 12. Um, and so, you know, this has been an area in which rates were already increasing um, before the pandemic, and we're seeing all of these factors that I was referencing before contributing to rising rates. So when we think of general characteristics of those who attempt or complete suicide, uh, you know, one of the biggest risk factors is a prior history of suicide uh, thoughts or suicidal behavior, but also those risk factors of poverty, trauma, neglect, uh, substance use, death in a family, divorce, um, custody issues, essentially things in the environment for that child um, can be, it's really a reflection of what's going on in that child's life in combination um, with maybe a family history of suicide or family history of mental health problems. Um, so it's that nature and nurture. Um, and all of that is really exacerbated uh, during the pandemic. So as I was saying before, suicide rates traditionally have been higher among whites than blacks. Um, however, those trends are changing. So as an adult psychiatrist, I tend to think of it in, in trends, right? And so it's really about proportionality, right? And so we have the absolute number of suicides versus the rates of suicide. Um, so while the the actual numbers of suicide may be higher in white populations, the rates are rising faster in black populations. So the gap is narrowing um, between those populations. And you can particularly see that um, in children. So uh, adolescents ages 13 to 17, um, the rates are, are nearly double um, in white populations, um, but the rate is increasing. Um, at a faster rate in black teens. And so if we look at this a little bit more closely, uh, it starts to really debunk the idea um, that suicide rates are actually higher for white children and that that's not um, going to change. You know, a common phrase you, you may have heard is that black people don't commit suicide. So there can be cultural implications to this if they're not identified as suicides. Number one, there's many ways that people can harm themselves and and lead to suicide that um, may not have been identified. So, so a common uh, term that's also used is suicide by cop, and that you, that often refers to uh, most often a young black male who engages with the police with the intention to be shot, which essentially is a form of suicide, but may be identified more as a homicide, for example. Um, so there are sort of cultural implications to these differences in the rates. Um, and th these have been talked about for, for years, um, but it's starting to um, come into the conversation again as the rates are rising. So again, these rates were doubling um, in black youth um, as far back as the 90s. Uh, to, you know, all the way to 2012, um, whereas in other populations, white populations, the rates were actually decreasing. And one um, thing I'll add to that, uh, Dr. Cassiano, is also I, I'll see, I see a certain behavior where youth are engaging in behaviors that will get them killed. Like, you know, you're violent, aggressive, and you're drug dealing, and you're doing other things that will actually end up getting you killed. There is no, no, no win out of it. 
Uh, and I see some of that as being an issue of uh, suicidal thinking and behavior as well. Sure, sure. And as an adult psychiatrist, I tend to broaden that idea, too. I mean, there's adults who stop taking their medication for, you know, blood pressure when they're, you know, really at risk for just for a heart attack or, you know, stroke. Um, and so it's really about sort of broadening the way we think about suicide. Um, it's not simply a firearm or, or pills or or being on a roof, right? It's really sort of this idea of engaging in something that can end one's life. Um, so 37% of all youth suicides uh, are black children, but they only make up 15% of the population. So wow. again, yeah, yeah, it's this idea of uh, disproportionate rates um, and the highest increase of all youth suicides are black males. Though it's also increasing in, in young black uh, teenage girls, I should say. So there, again, we've been talking about this for years, as far back, um, looking as far back as the 80s, even, um, there was sort of this call to action by the U.S. Surgeon General, um, Dr. Satcher, uh, this call to action to really address suicide in black communities, because it had been increasing for years, as we were saying earlier, from the 90s to 2012, even in the 80s, it had been really increasing. And there was this call to action um, when it was identified that the suicide rate among African American ages 10 to 14 increased 233% over that time period. Um, and the, the challenge was, as I sort of th thought about this and started to prepare for this, you know, in the media, suicide wasn't really talked about much at that time, right? It may have been talked about with mass shootings, for example, that, you know, there was uh, children who would go into schools and, and um, kill others, but then also commit suicide. That's how it was talked about in the media. And when you talked about death of um, the black population, black children was more often talked about in terms of homicide, for example. So it wasn't really something that was part of the conversation. Um, and Dr. Satcher was saying it needs to be part of the conversation. And here we are all these years later, still talking about it. Um, and so we really have to change the way we think about suicide, but also how we talk about it. And this is where I'll kind of hand it over to Dr. Uh, Higgins and I'll be jumping in as well. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Cassiano. And when we look at the factors, what is contributing to this? And much of that is a lack of culturally relevant behavioral health providers. So often black patients will seek out black providers. And sadly, if they can't find one, then many times they'll stop looking because they don't want to start over and trying to explain the black experience. And when you look at television, a lot of times, a black, the black experience is sometimes put to the side as if it's not relevant, which is telling individuals that they are not relevant. So you have your, you know, uh, also you have a lack with that lack of mental health providers. You know, the issue is you have to start all the way in the school. And many times you'll find maybe some more black counselors inside of black schools. Uh, but that can be difficult as well when you're looking at the educated population who can actually contribute to mental health and, and, the, and the risks that come into a lack of educated uh, black people who can actually rise to the ranks of getting their masters, PhDs, and MDs. So the risk of death um, uh, due to homicide is another uh, factor that we had just talked about so far as behaving in ways in which could get you killed. Uh, the unresolved traumas of the past of which we, you know, the, the issue of not knowing our history from Africa, being told what our history is uh, from, from, uh, from often a European or even a racist standpoint, uh, not that the two are synonymous, but not actually teaching the African history that we are. And then saying that black people, you know, start off in jungles, uh, became slaves, and then we uplifted them by enslaving them. And now, you know, then Martin Luther King happened and Black Lives Matter is bad, you know. And so now we're looking at the issues of how some are actually trying to criminalize our history and, and what actually happened to us and where we're actually from, which even gives more issues of this perceived rest, racism, and then the issue of the access to firearms, as Dr. Costa on there talked about, where people do not see themselves as contributing or a part of the society. So that rather than sticking with what we have going on, but taking the other way out, uh, which sadly uh, can be suicide. And that access to firearms is just growing, right? Continuing to grow, especially when you look at the state of Texas, oh. uh, where essentially you could just walk into a place and buy a gun. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing just in, you know, continually increasing in shootings where you don't have to have um, 
Well, you have to do a background check, but other than the background check, that has you don't have to require any kind of training or anything of that sort to have access to the to use the gun or have access to it. So key factors, um, and we have to understand that we truly don't know what's going on because it's such a new 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 trend, and there's a lack of research. So black people are killing themselves, but part of the racial trauma that we have is our youth are dying, but not a whole lot of people are talking about it. That is a problem when you're seeing these exponential increases uh, when it comes to black youth. The younger ones is more black men. As it comes to teenagers and adolescents, it's more of the black females. But America does not seem to be alarmed. This is not on the front page of the news that we're still having these alarming trends. And so we only recently found a marker for this. And when I say recently, we're talking about it today. But David Satcher talked about it back in 1995, where he was looking back from 1980 as, as we see this continual increase over the last 30 years. And the question is, what has happened? Uh, what is going on? And what can we do to help this? Other key factors, bullying and teasing. You do see some trends where if a child feels like they've been bullied or teased, they, you know, this can cause a big issue, especially when you're, you know, realizing that with the school age population, especially in middle school and high school, those are the only places where you're forced to be around a group of people that you may not like, that you may not have any interest, uh, similar interests as they do. The only place where you end up around that many people that you may not, may not like is actually jail or prison. That is the only place you're required to go to school every day. You have to see these people every day. And that can cause a lot of problems. Lack of access to mental health, the issue of racism, racial discrimination. And we also have to look at the issue of social media, where it's shown that the more social media that a child does, it actually can be detrimental to their mental health because you're looking at other lives, other people's lives and comparing your life to, uh, uh, to you're, you're comparing your life to their life, realizing that you're actually seeing just a snapshot. You're not seeing the true lives of individuals. I had somebody say to me, you know, oh, you and your wife on, on Facebook, you all look like Jay-Z and Beyonce. And I'm like, what life are y'all seeing? But then when I looked at my Facebook page, you see us in ball gowns and tuxedos and we out at the club and, you know, we're on the beach somewhere. And I'm like, that is not our lives. That is not what we do day in, day out. That is a snapshot of vacation that may occur every few months. Uh, but no, that is not we, what we do on a regular basis. So oftentimes parents are on their phones. The kid, the kid is distressed. We're trying to eat dinner. The television's on and the mom and dad is on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, maybe taking pictures of the food. Maybe they're doing work. You know, they're actually, do, you know, many, I know for me and my wife, we, we didn't, we, we're both doctors. We tend to have to do a lot of charting and things of that sort. So work does not just stay at work. Work also comes home and we have to handle it there. So the issue of these families being busy and also the issue of, you know, in black families, 70, like almost as much as 90 percent in some areas of black families are with single parent homes. 70 uh, percent of black families are in single parent homes and 90 percent of those will be with moms, understanding that women on average make less money than men. So the income disparities of a woman being underpaid, especially a black woman being underpaid and having to raise a child on her own without the support of another income inside the house can be very difficult and put individuals at risk for issues of poverty. So as we talk about this issue of poverty, poverty complicates everything. Socioeconomic status, uh, social determinants of health are very, so, are very much important to look at when you're looking at the outcomes of children. And when you look at black families, about a quarter of black children actually live below the poverty level. So, you know, so we're, we're more likely to be living below the poverty level, more likely to have access to resources. Um, all of these things are factors that we see that we believe is contributing to the impact of the uh, mental health on children. So the lack of neighborhood play when I was a child, even though I grew up in the hood, I would say that we played outside all the time. You had people who I mean, especially over the summer. I mean, basically eight thirty, nine o'clock. We were outside and we were outside until the streetlights came on and the streetlights coming on meant that everybody had to go home. All right. And I could tell you as a kid, we were outside so much. I knew the order in which the streetlights came on because I had to be in the house before the streetlight came on in front of my house. So I knew which order that they would they, they, they would pop up. So you better be in the house before the streetlights came on. We had a neighborhood community where I knew where every I knew everybody who lived inside the house, even when their cousin and their grandmama came over. I knew the car because we were so close back then. But we've lost that with this Internet, with Internet and gaming and things of that sort. 
the trauma and violence inside of the community. So many black children live in, live in areas where there's a lot of violence that goes on, uh, where there's an increased homicide and death rate. Um, you know, honestly, you know, just hearing the helicopter go over, seeing the searchlight come on, uh, living in a place where you're hearing the gunshots go off and everybody in the house has to hit the floor because somebody is shooting outside. These, and then with that occurring so close, you would know some of these people who actually died or who were killed. And that trauma is something that carries on. Realizing also whatever happens in the home also happens with the child. And so the difference with children being in a traumatic home is that children are not in control of the decision making that is going on inside the house. So adults can decide to leave, be like, peace, I'm out. I'm done with this. Or they can fight or fight back or whatever it might be. But the child is like I, I described it as the rubber, rubber duck inside the tub. As the water is splashing around, the rubber duck is just bouncing around, slamming into the wall. Mm -hmm. And too often what we don't understand that what is going on with the adults is also impacting the children. So the issue of the thought that children do not experience trauma is a falsehood. If it's happening in the house, it's happening to the child and not to mention other things that are going on inside the home that are nefarious, that especially with school being out and people being virtual, a lot of times the teachers are not able to pick this up because the children are not around that professional individual who will actually pick up when there are some changes that are not being discussed. Well, yeah, I was just going to add as a parent, you know, I was thinking about this, like parenting is hard <laughs> these days. You know, my son, he was with his uh, little cousin and we were waiting like, at a restaurant. I had this bag of everything I was going to bring with me to try to keep them entertained. Again, this is pre-pandemic. So I brought like a deck of cards. Right. So I give him a deck of cards, say, go sit over there. I teach him how to play. You know, I declare war or something, which I think is called something different now. But they did it for like three minutes and then just kind of looked at me like, well, what do we do with these cards now? Versus I remember with my own cousin, I played that for hours. I mean, there wasn't anything else to do. There wasn't, you know, we didn't have a tablet. We didn't have my parents' cell phone, you know, as we're waiting to eat dinner at the restaurant. Um, and so parenting is hard, right? It's, there's all these outside influences um, when it comes to technology in particular, um, that are hard and you have to get creative in, in how you engage them. I keep talking about the school that he's at now. I love it. They have an after school program. They're teaching them how to make paper airplanes. Love it. Just They just need a piece of paper. I love it. It's better for their brains. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So and the, the world has access to your child now. Yeah. I mean, with these electronic media, I mean, the world has complete access to your child, which can be very scary. Uh, so the issue of uh, issues of fear of, of the situation of not understanding mental health, the fear of the mental health operations so far as doctors and social workers. Too often kids are put, especially, you know, um, black families, too often the access to mental health occurs well after there's been a trauma. So there's a trauma in the home. Now you're dealing with CPS and social workers who are looking at removing the child from the home or you go into foster care and, you know, they put you in foster care around a group of people that you don't know. Other kids who have similar problems that could be even traumatic to be even around them. And then you sit me in front of you as a child psychiatrist. And it's like I'm there to help. But honestly, the child sees me as part of the system at that point. Or too often, you know, if it's a juvenile and they're in a, some sort of juvenile detention facility, I'm actually there to help as a mental health provider. But too often I'm actually seen as somebody who's a part of the system. So the issue of government insurance, because of issues of poverty, more likely to end up on government insurance. And that can be very difficult when it comes to politics on access to money. Uh, you know, I know in the state of Texas, we actually refuse the, me the Medicaid money that is actually paid in by the by the uh, citizens of the state do not come back from the United States to supply, you know, funding for, for Medicaid, which causes people to be underpaid and cause a lot of doctors to drop it. Stigma of mental illness or lack of awareness, the fear of the medical model. And too often we go to everybody else before we actually go to the doctor. We'll talk to our mama or we talk to grandmama, or big mama, or Mima, or Mimi or, and auntie such and such. But then we'll go and talk to somebody down the street. All right. Who had a son or somebody, a daughter who had a mental health issue. Then we go to the church and talk to the elders and talk to the pastor. We'll talk to everybody typically. 
sometimes maybe hopefully we'll make it to the primary care doctor to mention something, but too often it's too too late to, before we actually wait, before we actually go and see a mental health provider about a mental health issue. So this issue of not seeking professional help and then being labeled if you do, you know, so far as you actually went to go see somebody. And I, and I know folk who are very judgmental of family who actually go and get help. Like you grew up in a family that was, let me just for lack of a better way of saying it, your family is cray. You figured out that this is cray. And then when you go decide to get help about it, they think you cray. All right. So that judgment issue is something that causes people to fear um, receiving mental health because you're seen it as being weak or being judged by the others around you. Yeah. And that delay for children, you know, um, just has long lasting impacts, right? So you want to identify early so you can intervene early. Otherwise, you're playing catch up. So what I learned as a parent, you know, K through three, they're learning how to read, um, you know, versus beyond that, you're reading to learn. So if everything is delayed in their treatment, they're not being identified with ADHD or learning disorder until fifth or sixth grade, high school age. It's playing catch up at that point. Right. All that delay um, really, um, you know, kind of. And worsens the impairment um, and the catch up to, to try to intervene. Now, we're looking at why are the higher rates in the ages of 10 to 24, so early to late adolescence. And as Dr. Cassione had just talked about, untreated mental health issues, this should have been handled when you were younger. It should have been picked up when you were, you know, in, in, in starting kindergarten. But too often it was missed at that point. And you've had this lifehood of actually struggling through your mental health, struggling to focus, struggling to pay attention, difficulty concentrating, maybe even learning disabilities, where some people don't even know that they have a learning disability because it was never picked up or identified. And, and that becomes an issue of changes in stress and changing the trajectory trajectory of your life simply because things were not seen early. You know, we talked about parent, parental workload. So even if the family notices that there's something going on, too often families are, are not in a situation where I can take off of work. You know, I work an hourly job. If I miss three or four hours of work, that that actually has is a detriment at on Friday when my paycheck is less by forty, fifty dollars because I had to take off from work. The pressures of society and having to perform. You know, at these ages, you're coming out of middle, you know, middle school to high school, high school to college. The needing to perform, to 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 be a good student, to be a good athlete, uh, to to be able to function academically, to make it to that next step, um, turning a blind eye to what the issue is, so far as either not knowing or you do know and you look away and not making it a priority that your mental health is something that needs to be taken care of. Too often in mental health, we talk about the individual versus the collective, in that um, so often I can get people, a uh, persons to to receive their treatment based upon not on how it affects them, but actually how it impacts their family. So far as your mom is struggling, she's having to take off from school or work. Um, the issue of you, you, you want to be able to provide for yourself, and but for your family, and you want to do well for, for those around you and those who are looking for you to do well. So why don't we try and look at treatment and taking care of yourself so that you can improve performance, not only for yourself, but for the collective of your family and your home. And the issue of social media and the stresses of that and having the floss. And, you know, I was sadly looking at a, um, a television show and it was talking about a group of rappers and how rap has changed from the 80s, 90s. And now, you know, a rapper was saying that, you know, people are asking, when is she going to get her work done? So far as physical changes to her body in order to look good for the tele look as what they call good for the television camera. So far as enhancements physically and a lot of ch a lot of children are under stress to look a certain way, you know, basically, you know, at home at nine o'clock at night, getting their hair done, putting on their makeup up so they can do social media in order to impress other people. And that judgment issue is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Now, let's look at the younger kids for five to 12. You know, the issue is um, with five to 12 year olds, there's an issue of language development. All right. So the issue becomes not only are you struggling, but because of your lack of language development, sometimes you don't even know what's bothering you. You can't put words to it. It's difficult to communicate that to older adults. So too, too often when we're talking to kids, we're trying to use our own language because we have language as adults. And then we're asking the kid, do you feel depressed? And the kid does. Are you are you sad? 
And then the part, the problem with not understanding kids is that we may think that's defiance. And the problem is that the kid doesn't know what you actually mean. All right. Do you feel hopeless or helpless? And they're like, and then they look sad and they put their head down and then people get mad or at them. And they're just sitting there being kids because I don't understand any psychiatric terms. So the problem of not being able to understand things cause you to be have difficulty in agitation, especially in tolerating things around you. When you're sitting in the classroom and you don't know what's going on, you don't understand what the teacher's talking about and everything is passing by you is a very scary thing. The other issue becomes the lack of understanding death and finality. You know, so far as I'm afraid, I'm scared, I'm upset. I don't know what to do. So therefore, I have the issue of not understanding death, but also the younger the child, the more prone they are to impulsivity and not thinking all the way through all the situations. So this issue of anger, of not understanding, of being sad, upset, a lot of things going around around us, despair that I can't, no one is understanding me. I can't communicate what's going on and then hopelessness. And so hopelessness is a key factor when you're looking at risk of suicide and that my situation can't get any better because I have a lack of understanding of the world of how to change what is going on. So youth suicides and risk, understand this, when it comes to youth suicides, approximately one third is seen with depressive symptoms. But actually when it comes to suicide attempts, 60% of suicide attempts are kids between the ages of of kids between the ages of five to twelve are issues of ADHD, impulsivity, or possibly undiagnosed mood or affective disorders. But the fact is that ADHD, hyperactivity, impulsivity is seen more so with youth suicides than depression. So I believe that part of our issue of not being able to find where this is coming from is because we're looking in the wrong door. We're looking in the depressive affective disorder door when we really need to be looking at ADHD, the frustration of life, because at five to 12, school is all you do. That is the majority of what you do. Imagine if you went to work and you did not understand what your job was. And you can't find pens. You can't find pencils. You can't find the desk. You can't find the door. You can't even go to the restroom when you want to because people may get mad at you because you already were not doing focus, not focused and paying attention and doing your work. And now I need to go to the restroom and the teacher believes that I'm being defiant and I'm trying to hold it. All right. All of that goes into it. And that's the stress that comes with not being able to function in school. So the risk tends to be on how it's done. Hanging, strangulation, and suffocation are the most common ways. And I remember working on this actual talk when, at, when I was working on this talk a few, a couple, about three or four years back. I had a friend of mine, real close friend of mine, fraternity brother, whose son stood up inside the um, stood, stood up inside the cafeteria, put his belt around his neck, and was pulling it, trying to kill himself. As a, as I was working on some of these slides a few years back, so this is a very real issue that is impacting families, adolescent suicides tend to be more towards depression, all right? So symptoms of depression, and they tend to get more into firearms and even strangulation as well. So you start to see those more adult-like ways of which uh, suicide occurs when the older the child is. Yeah, the way you're describing walking through school sounds stressful to say the least and, you know, traumatic. Um, as we think of all the other factors in the pandemic, I mean, you know, work, work is already stressful, let alone, you know, as you were describing it. And, and sadly, you know, I remember a young lady who I, a, um, a patient of mine who was having issues of explosive anger and aggression in the classroom. And it seemed to occur only in certain classes. And I asked her what was going on. And she said that the problem is that I'm not able to read. I'm in the 10th grade and I can't read. And in the classes where they force us to read, I prefer to act up and act out before letting my peers know that I don't I'm not able to read. And I'm like, well, what kind of resources are being done in school for you to be able to read? She was like, what resources? I'm going to talk to the parent. Like, is she in receiving, you know, funding or a 504 plan or, I, you know, IEP or anything like that? And she was like, no. I'm like, nobody in the school is identified that you can't read. And I think that was hidden through the behavior. So she's trying to hide it. Because it's very embarrassing to be 14, 15 uh, years old and you cannot read the information. 
So 42 percent of children and adolescents with intellectual disabilities have suicidal thoughts or gestures. So this is a risk factor for actual for risk factor of suicide, because now it doesn't mean that you will commit suicide. But to have suicidal thoughts and gestures is something that makes you can be concerned of a later risk of, of you know, completion of suicide. Also, an issue is that I have a learning disability or ADHD and I have a higher than average IQ. And that makes it even more frustrating is that I am actually intelligent and I may be more intelligent than the average person in the room. But my dyslexia or my learning disability or my agraphia is causing me to struggle, even though I actually know the information. I can't demonstrate it in the classroom Other comorbid psychiatric issues such as depression, anxiety, mania. Sadly, I've had people to have me evaluate ADHD in a child who's psychotic. And I'm like, yes, it's going to be hard to focus if you got voices yelling in your head while you're trying to read. All right. Other psychosocial stressors. You never know what's going on inside one of these kids houses. You never know what's going on inside the home that could be causing issues in performance at school. So children, when we're looking at issues of depression, children present differently. They tend not to say, hey, I'm having issues with depression. They don't tend to say that. They don't read the DSM, go online, read up on depression and give you a description of exactly how somebody else would say depression is. They have come in with somatic issues so far as stomach ache or headache, trying to get out of going to school, sometimes irritability, you know, hostility, a lot of anger issues and behavioral acting out and that they're demonstrating the issue of depression more so than they're able to speak it out. So, you know, the issue of lack of articulation of what the problem is and the problem of you know, uh, when you look at the issues of uh, dropping off of schoolwork, increased disciplinary issues, what is changing this child? You know, is there issue of physical trauma, sexual trauma? I had a kid whose grades started dropping and she got referred by the by her teacher on what was going on. And she had just uh, lost her grandmother. So her grandmother had passed away the week before. And then I know at the time we used to have this thing where if you did not pass your exam in the third grade that you would be failed for the third grade. So you had a top student, lost a grandmother, facing, you know, grade to dropping, facing the exam that's coming up next week. And she's looking at maybe I won't be able to pass to the fourth grade because of this standardized test. And that can cause issues of despair even more so and, and drive the risk for that child. And understand that educators around are around our kids more than we are. I know for myself, I know I work a lot. I work hard. Um, chances are I'm not going to be around my daughter one hour every day with just focus on me and her. All right. But the thing about the educators is that they're in class with your child at least one hour per day, five days per week. And educators are key in picking things up. As a former school teacher myself, you know, I taught school for a hot second. Teaching school taught me I needed to go to medical school and become a child psychiatrist. I need to work on this from a different direction. Um, we have to, the teacher often will notice the sadness of the child being withdrawn. Um, depression looks more so when the class, you know, you have a kid who's normally engaged in the class who's starting to put their head down somatic complaints, needing to go to the nurse's office for some reason, not wanting to go to go to school and withdrawing from other activities and play where they're not running outside with their friends. You know, it's recess time. They don't want to leave. They would prefer to stay in the room. And you see this change in behavior. And many times it is the teacher that is key. And with kids being out of school, you're missing that connection. And again, it amazes me what teachers are doing, right? Like, so is parenting is hard, but teaching, they're teaching them, you know, their education, um, but they're also looking out for their social emotional development, right? And that's one thing I do love about schools now is that that's incorporated more and more into the curriculum. Um, you know, one, I think it helps teachers, but also two, to give children the language, right? To, to talk about how they feel, how to, how to cope with it, you know, doing mindfulness and yoga in school. These are the things, the interventions that are needed. So school, what can schools do that is exactly what Dr. Cassiano was saying. School connectedness. We need to show in the schools that schools care. All right. Schools care about the well-being of the, ch of the children. And you can teach. You teach a lot of social development in school. Peers need to be able to care. I, I knew of a kid who had committed suicide uh, in a local school. 
a very tragic story. He had some physical disabilities and the kids would tease him and sometimes even take his stuff away from him where he would be lost, lost in a situation where he wasn't able to move uh, because he required assistance. And I thought to myself, like when I was a kid, we were taught to actually be nice to the person. And as kids in elementary school, we wanted to help. You know, like I want to I want to push. Uh, let me get that for you. Things of that sort. And that's what we were taught. And you say to yourself, like, how did these group of kids miss that? Like, how did that occur? So facilitating a positive community, because too often, I think in our recent days, we've seen adults say negative and ugly things on television, sometimes even political figures that is not being checked by the adult inside the home. So if something occurs that is going on in the environment that does not seem to be what of, of what an adult should behave, you also have children emulating that behavior. And it's important that we have to teach a positive community, teaching healthy, healthy behaviors, and also when to seek help and support seeking help. If you notice that a peer is having difficulty, it used to be that if somebody said, saw something bad, then you would tell the teacher. But now we're sometimes we've gotten to this anti-snitch culture where we don't tell anyone what's going on. So teaching social learning and mental health is going to be key and it needs to be done early in schools. You can actually teach this information. No, this should be taught in elementary school, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, all the way through high school. Because if we educate kids early, they can recognize when they're having an issue, but they can also recognize when their peers are having issues. And that is going to be key in order to decrease these risks that we're seeing right now. The issue of bullying in school. So often when we hear of completed suicides, children will complain of bullying. And understanding that not only is it an issue with the child, but we have to be able to identify as adults and recognize racial bias. I'll say as, a, as an adult, I did not experience the issues that my child experienced and that there were things that just were not said in school. That was not acceptable, but because we're seeing it on social media and, and it's being allowed even through some of our adults, political figures to say negative and ugly things um, that essentially you've seen this bleed into the school issue where I never heard somebody say the N word in school or, um, you know, or after the uh, one of the presidential elections, uh, other kids were yelling at kids and yelling in the yelling in the cafeteria, build the wall, build the wall build the wall, and you have 25% of the school is actually Hispanic, realizing that Houston's an international city. Not everybody's from Mexico. And also understand that every Mexican, never, many never lived in Mexico. They've always been Texans, you know. You know, so this 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 issue of trying to tie people together into a racial class or group so that we may be aggressive towards them is a, is a big problem. Too often I'll hear where schools will say or teachers will say, well, their hands are tied. If they say something to the child, then the parent may come back at them and give a complaint. And then that goes to the principal and that can end up on the teacher's file. So many times the, the teachers feel like they may not have the power to do much or say much uh, because of. Of, of how that may be perceived negatively towards them and understand that bullying, is it a big deal because all kids bully each other? Yes, it is a big deal because things are very different now. It used to be where some kids said something in class, but because of social media, now they have these things where they do raids on your social media, where Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, TikTok, where they'll make videos about you laughing and talking about you and they make it essentially a worldwide web event. And then I've even seen where people have these groups that just crash individuals over and over and over again, telling them to kill themselves. I'm like, I, I had never even heard of this until like the, fact, the last few years. So this interaction between students and teachers and parents matter, and we have to be on top of this and so that we can try to prevent, detect, and actually do something right now, not waiting uh, for it to progress, but do something right now in trying to get these things under control. We have to be careful about media coverage and suicide contagion. It is seen that the more, especially when it comes to uh, adolescents and young adults, the more popular the person is who committed suicide, the more likely you are to see contagion in the community. Uh, some would call it copycat 
uh, situation. But the thing, the, and I've seen this change in the last few years on how we cover suicide, whereas the person is admired, they commit suicide, and then this is, there's this outpouring of love and talking about who they were in their lives. Uh, and then sadly, many times persons will see this as an option of letting the world know about them and then committing suicide. And then you're seeing this outpouring again. So we have to have responsible reporting of the situation. And we need to uh, go through and talk about more of stories of hope and resilience. How did I pull through even in this situation? Because oddly enough, more than one person is dealing with that. And when they see somebody pull through in, in a positive way, oddly enough, that becomes cont contagion as well. So we need to focus on these stories of folk who dealt with these issues and pulled through and became positive individuals. And this happens all the time. We need to put the focus on that. So in decreasing risk, we have to target those who are at highest risk. So we have to target ADHD learning disabilities as well as, well as issues of depression and affective disorders. So improving access to mental health services, you know, I would say when my mother was a uh, my mother, God rest her soul, was a counselor that had much of me going into psychiatry. But at her school, they had three counselors. And two APs at an elementary school. Now you have schools who have zero counselors where they're having to share counselors between schools. All right. So we have to have that. The teachers need to be educated. We need earlier access to mental health, reducing access to lethal means and increasing culturally competent mental health providers. And that oddly enough, people find this to be, and I don't find it to be odd, black patients tend to have better outcomes with black doctors. So we have to train, train teachers and youth providers. You know, youth can understand and see things that are going on. Now, I do not recommend that youth intervene necessarily, but being able to report to an adult what they're seeing. Curriculum and training is something that GHP does. We actually did something with Rock Hill School District by uh, Dr. James Lee. We actually have some stuff that may be going on very soon in the New York area as well. Expanding the role of counselors to be able to get into school. If you all do not know, most counselors are not actually counseling children in schools. Most counselors are doing paperwork in schools. So like a child is having a problem, then you send them to the counselor. The counselor doesn't get to counsel because sometimes they've been teaching classes. So we have to expand the role of counselors mm -hmm. as the mental health provider in the school because they're sorely needed and stop distracting them with other things. A lot of teachers complain that I don't do a whole lot of teaching, I actually do more paperwork. So increasing the amount of counselors and mental health professionals, social workers, especially in impoverished communities, can make a huge difference in these communities. Now, be careful on how you perceive black people. Black people are not a monolith, all right? Just because somebody has dark skin does not necessarily mean that they are black or even if they do consider themselves to be black, they may not be consider themselves to be part of those blacks or that those blacks over there. So African-Americans with a history before 1865 and the end of slavery can have a very different um, history than somebody who immigrated to the United States uh, as a recent. All right. Uh, from Af from Africa. Also, you have to look at the issue of generational trauma and, and slavery itself. I was going through, I'm going to give a personal conversation here. I was going through my mother's home. She's passed away. And I saw a school census of my grandparents. And I saw a name on there that I had never heard of. But I saw him on one census and then I didn't see him on a later census. And I'm like, who was, I called my sister, like, who was this? I called uh, uh, my eldest cousin. Who was this person? I never knew that my grandparents had another brother. And they said, baby brother got burned up in the house by the sheriff. And I'm like, what was that story about? They were like, we don't know. That was the story. So this is a generational trauma that was not talked about in the family, but definitely impacted the family to have a kid burned up in the house by the sheriff. So these things we don't talk about, but that causes, you know, that's not during slavery. That is after slavery in the Jim Crow South in rural Texas, um, the, uh, Caribbean blacks. You know, I, I've seen where some people say I'm not black because I speak French or I speak Spanish or I'm Creole speaking or something like that. Where, where they say that, well, I'm not actually black. I'm Hispanic because I speak Spanish. But many folk will see themselves as being the same and some will see themselves as being different. Um, and then the issue of I'm not sure you are, but since you're an American, you have dark skin that makes you black. And you may not be black at all. 
All right. You may not be of African ancestry or what would be considered African ancestry to you and your people. You're from a dark where we are from a place where people are dark skin colored and have kinky hair. But you may not even perceive yourself as being black. But the fact, though, is that in America, you may be perceived that way, which may not be your history at all. So things that we did not get to, but are very important to look uh, to look at. I know I was um, is that the issue of genetic theory of inferiority, where people will be perceived as not being fully human or three fifths of a man. Or the fact is that people may not see that you can be educated. We're not worried about the, this kid not being able to focus, pay attention because, you know, the kid is black and black people are slower than other people just by dark skin makes your brain slow. Um, the choosing death over circumstances. You know, uh, the fact is that many blacks committed suicide and jumped off slave ships rather than be slaves in America. So this is not a phenomenon that is new. This is something that has been seen. The issue of racism and white supremacy that is not being addressed, where you're making some people's history actually to be a crime to be taught in school. Uh, the media and the black super thug, where many kids do not see themselves as being black because I'm not a thug. When you look at television, you know, I, I don't put on put on certain clothes and wear, carry myself as a, a certain way as a woman. The other side of that is that perception can bleed over to other societies where you acting up or you being hyperactive or you having a problem can be seen as a, uh, as a norm of which you're being stereotyped is that j that's just how black people are. The issues of microaggressions, oddly enough, we lost Chester Pierce, Pierce, just Chester Pierce about uh, six years ago and microaggressions have become a lot more popular after his death and he had talked about this in the 1970s. Uh, it was more popular in the last five years than it was in the five years before that. Uh, and oddly enough, I've seen him where people have misperceiving actually how he actually came, uh, how he developed that concept and his de definition of it. Incarceration in third grade reading levels. They actually judge on how many people, how many jail beds we need to, and prison beds we need based upon third grade re reading levels. And the third grade is where you start to see disparities in education when it comes to uh, black versus white youth. The issues of poverty, nutri nutrition and toxic environments, we hit on that, but those are full slides in themselves that we really didn't go into as much as I would have liked us to have if we had more time. And the issue of punishment versus treatment. The fact is that too often we're punishing and criminalizing ADHD and some, so, some studies show that 75% of everyone in prisons and jails in the U.S. are people with ADHD and learning disabilities. And we've now criminalized that successfully, sadly, uh, and actually are making money off of, you know, ADHD and, and uh, learning disabilities uh, through the uh, through incarcerative and punitive environments. Now, this is something I developed from a good colleague of mine and, and a mentor by by the name of Orlando Lightfoot. And I pulled it off one of his uh, emails that he put on social media or on a listserv once. But, you know, changes into the system that are needed are go as well as education, health housing, economics, legal system, environment, media, social discourse, and healthcare. The fact is that too often we believe that it's one thing that we need to do in order to change this. And no, it, realizing this is a system, it is systematic. And the, and the issue of systematic racism is that it hits in all of these in areas and environments, which causes us to end up in a bad situation for our children with well, throughout you know, the diaspora, but especially when it comes to ADHD, learning disabilities and improving outcomes, all of these factors go into it and it's never just one, one thing. So people say, well, if you put more money in schools, that won't improve ADHD or outcomes. No, it won't. That one thing won't do it. It requires money in school, money in edu you know, health, housing, education, legals, economics. All of these things are factors that impact outcomes in communities. I used to decide to love it. It just shows how everything's connected, right? There's You might be in your one small piece, but it's all connected. So the profile of youth suicide, especially of black youth, youth suicide, ADHD and learning disabilities. That's why it's important that organizations like Chad have these conversations and talks. Underlying mood disorders contribute. A normal to elevated IQ in that is very frustrating when you're very intelligent, very smart, and you cannot perform and being judged because of your own medical issue. I tell people, you know, a kid with ADHD is struggling in school. It's like, you need to work harder. It's like telling a kid who's bound to a wheelchair to get up and run. All right. It's a very sad and sick thing to expect people to do when you're not addressing the primary need. The issue of trauma and bullying that occurs that affects actually cognition and being able to focus in school and the lack of social support so far as home and school, uh, the issue of hopelessness setting in, 
perceived racism and the sadly, sadly being increasingly black puts you at risk when you put all of these factors together. Thank you all so much. These are some resources. What we'll make sure that we do is share this with you. This is our two books, Mind Matters, a resource guide to psychiatry for black communities, question and answer format. There's a whole chapter written by Dr. Michael Pratt on uh, children and, and, um, and ADHD and uh, maladies of the mind that affect kids. This, this book is written for the late public on a sixth, seventh grade level. So any, just about every adult should be able to be able to read it. The other book is How Amari Learned to Love School Again, a story about ADHD, where we have black faces, black, pretty black characters with a black family supporting a young man who's struggling with ADHD somewhere around the first, second grade. And the fact also is that we have a parent guide in the back where we discuss much of what we're talking about right now, it's actually in the parent guide of that book. You can find both of these books on Amazon. You can also find a third book that we have, which is How Bree, uh, Bree's Journey to Joy. A yeah, story I mean, about childhood yeah. grief and depression. Yeah. So Bree's Journey to Joy, uh, a story about childhood grief and depression, which is set during the COVID pandemic where we're talking about bereavement and depression. And our Dr. Cassiano was the lead person on that project for us. This is how you find me. Um, you can find me at Napoleon Higgins. You can find Elaine Cassion as well. One, one email that we don't have on here, sorry, is the info at ghpsychiatry.org. Info at ghpsychiatry. No, I'm sorry. Info at ghpsychiatry.com. Info at ghpsychiatry.com, and we'll actually get, get you whatever slides that you would like to have, or we'll try to get these slides to Chad. And if you want to take this information and use it, only thing that we ask is that you let no, you don't have to let us know. Just say Global Health Psychiatry. Just say, <laughs> say it one time, all right? Mention the books for it to help people, but this, this slide deck is for you to be able to use. So, yes, I did put our um, email address in the question and answer and the chat. Um, and just to give you a few ideas of the discussion and the questions, um, the discussion was great. It really uh, touched on a lot of different areas, much like that slide that you showed that has like social discourse and all the systemic factors. So um, the, the, the comments were uh, really uh, rich, I should say. We also have some uh, questions here. Um, there's a couple of them about ADHD coaches, um, both from the perspective of sort of funding for coaches, um, having uh, coaches of color, black um, coaches, um, and as well as can we have uh, community members sort of serve as coaches, uh, so, some, someone like Auntie, like we were saying. Um, so I don't know if you want to sort of speak to that one. That question. Yeah, um, I would say I actually have a whole slide or two on ADHD and coaching. Uh, these are things that we could definitely do. You know, so far as time management, using knowing how to use use your phone for as a as an access. A lot of people with ADHD, you know, I tell families so often. A lot of times, parents are set, are serving as the executive functioning uh, or executive secretary for for the child. Uh, how to make sure that the child understands the diagnosis uh, and trying to help them focus and pay attention. So ADHD coaching is something that is very important um, for children, but also for adults. You know, it's also important for adults and and, learn, and also understanding your learning style, giving children a place in which they need to focus, that they know that when I sit at this table, this is my quiet space. This is my, my workspace. Um, having time set up to where it could be where you have a regiment to the day. All of that goes into ADHD coaching and is very is something that is very important um, for for throughout the throughout the lifespan It's very important. And I found ADHD type coaching helps people who don't even have ADHD. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So then we have a, another question um, asking about somatic symptoms, um, you know, in particular in non-white cultures. Um, and can somatic symptoms really be a reflection of depression? Um, and there's, you know, of course, growing evidence that of this mind-body connection. Um, but if you wanted to speak to that, you know, in terms of somatic symptoms, specifically as they relate to depression, the question was about, I think, in adults, um, but also in children. Yeah, and the fact is that many times people uh, will say that, you know, you know, just all psychiatric diagnoses don't fit DSM simply because other cultures don't use that type of wording to, d to discuss you know, mental health issues. And that when a person is depressed, they feel depressed. No one says, you know, I think depressed today. 
You know, no, you say I feel depressed. Or when you're feeling anxious, you know, stomach in knots, uh, I feel anxiety, I feel stomach pain, I feel nauseous, I feel headaches. That is a part of the entire depressive symptomatology of which people of color many times will discuss. Now, you know, it's easy to make a diagnosis or treatment when a person, you know, speaks that particular language and they looked up stuff online. And, you know, I have families who in one sentence will tell me all the criteria for ADHD for their kid. All right. Uh, because of discussion groups and things of that sort. But if you're not from that particular group, then too often it may be missed by other things. And so as psychiatrists and mental health professionals and, and, and as people who are ADHD coaches and lay individuals, we have to be able to look at those other symptoms and how people describe it. And, you know, I have a family, you know, a family will come in and be, and say something like, you know, I, you know, I was about to say and be like, but I'm trying to use trying to use clinical terms. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to use the terms that people I don't know who all we got on the thing here. But I say, look at this boy. Look at him. All right. Can't you tell? He always acting up. He throw and I can't do nothing with this boy. This boy won't listen to nothing I say. We take him to school. We give him his classwork and he don't do nothing but act up the whole time. And then you say, does he have focus and attention issues? He can focus whenever he wants to. Get, you know, is he able to pay attention, sit still when he when he's sitting in front of that game? So does he have hyperactivity? No, he don't. He can be very calm when he's doing whatever you want to do. And as a clinician, you may be missing that the person is telling you the descriptions of ADHD on their own terms and in their own culture. And then you'll say, this kid does not have ADHD. This kid has ODD. Right. Because you missed how the person was com uh, was conversa having the conversation or conversating, how the conversation was going uh, in trying to describe the child's symptoms because essentially that person did not read the DSM. They're describing it in their own terms, and the doctor may completely miss it if they don't understand culture and how people explain things. Realizing also that people that people of color, especially black people, tend to speak more so in metaphors and in description. So it's not always the word that is coming out, but the context and the behavior that goes along with the words that are coming out to describe exactly what they're saying. Right. And in our Mind Matters book, in the uh, chapter on depression, I believe we talk about some of this. The way that I often frame it to patients is, you know, these are mental health problems are, are medical conditions. Depression is a medical condition. It's just that it's happening in our brain. And so this is the way it looks. The symptoms come out as behaviors. And so we think we can will them away, that we can control them. But the symptoms of depression are, uh, you know, a sad mood, difficulty enjoying things, but changes in sleep, appetite, energy, these are all parts of that mind-body connection. Um, and exactly the way we talk about them is different in different um, cultures. So certainly in our Mind Banners book, you can see a little bit more about that as well. Uh, we did have a, a question um, from a, uh, a white provider who wanted um, some guidance on how to talk about some of these um, topics with um, patients of color, BIPOC patients, um, without feeling as though they're burdening them. Um, when they raise these topics? Well, I, I, would, I would make sure to understand that one, we want to be a cultural scientist as much as we want to be a behavioral scientist. So that goes along with being a behavioral scientist and trying to understand culture. So listening and tuning into this goes a long ways to show that interest. The other thing is that if you don't know, ask. You know, so too often in medicine, we're taught that, you know, we need to hide the fact that we don't know because we're doctors and doctors know everything. No, I don't know everything. All right. I, and I, if I don't understand the question, the thing I want to do is ask the question, because when people ask questions, it actually shows your interest. It does not show your ignorance. It shows your interest in them. Now, of course, I wouldn't say now I wouldn't say something like, well, I know you're black and I know the black people are less likely to take their medication from a white doctor. So, you know, I'm as a white doctor, I ask you to take the medication that that would just be no. You don't do that. All right. You don't engage in it that way. But by being thorough in your work and making sure that you take that next step, patients will pick up that you have an interest in them. So, to, you know, I would say do your job, do your job well and try to look for any blind spots that you may have. By listening to this presentation, that tells me more than often than not, you're probably already trying to find your blind spots so that you can have better outcomes with patients. And the last area I think I see here, um, is there research on self-harm, self-injury rates in Black youth with ADHD? And any thoughts on how to provide better psychoeducation for children and families? 
Right. So the fact is that um, we can actually, there is some data out there. You, we're seeing more of incidence data, more than uh, in-depth research, but we need to put the time there and interest there so that we can have better outcomes. We're, we, one, we've picked up that there's an issue. There's an there's a issue going on. Now we need more researchers to look exactly why this is going on and try to understand this trend so that we may stop it. And don't Thank forget you. the book, How Amari Learned to Love School Again, a story about ADHD does cover some of this information. Thank you so much, Dr. Higgins and Dr. Castellano.